introduce yourself. Oh, yeah. OK. Uh, so I'm Ryan Lorty. Uh, I'm a member of the GNOME project for a long time. Uh, and I sort of a, a small while ago undertook uh, improving the relationships of GNOME and FreeBSD. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess that's the introduction, in fact. Um, so uh, I noticed that there were two big problems. Uh, and I was sort of approaching it uh, from the problem that uh, GNOME had. Uh, but there was also a problem in FreeBSD, which was that uh, GNOME on FreeBSD was not happy. Uh, there was like version 2 in the ports. Uh, like version 3 came out, and it was many, many years, and there was still version 2 in there. And it, it was kind of a bad situation, because uh, GNOME is big and unwieldy, and it tends to touch a lot of things. And every time a new version came out, it would be like, OK, um, what's broken now? OK, well, everything's broken. So we got to file a, bu a bunch of bugs, get it fixed upstream. Hopefully, it'll be fixed in the next version. OK, great, it's fixed. But now a whole bunch of other stuff is broken. Um, and this was just because you know, if you're doing something only once every six months or even sometimes longer, uh, it, it's not fast enough to catch the problems as they're happening. Um, on the other side, uh, I maintain glib, uh, which is sort of like the base library of GNOME. And it's kind of a, a mess uh, when it comes to portability. Uh, we have so much stacks of if def code around certain things like uh, stat and stat VFS and stat FS and uh, just you know basic stuff like how do I figure out how many free blocks there are in this file system. There are about eight different ways of doing this depending on the operating system you're on, um, like old versions of Solaris and stuff. I don't even know how much of that code we use. Uh, this is a problem for me because I kind of want to rip it out. And I'm kind of wondering, well, if I rip it out, is somebody going to get angry at me? Am I going to get hate mail? Um, I don't know. Uh, so wouldn't it be nice if we had like an actual set of supported systems that we knew that we supported, uh, and we had a way of testing uh, those systems? Um, so we sort of uh, decided in glib. Um, and if glib does something and says, this is the way it is, it's pretty much affecting all of GNOME, because you need glib to run GNOME. Uh, so we said, we're going to move away from this idea that we theoretically support anyone who wants to come to us. Uh, and we're going to try and nail down uh, more concretely an idea of we support these platforms uh, because we care about them. And we know we support them because we actually tested it. Um, we, it's not just theoretical, hey, somebody sent me a patch a long time ago. Maybe it's still working. Uh, it's, it's something that we're testing regularly. Uh, so we have a list of t platforms that we actually target. And we actually do test regularly on most of them. Um, and we, we've gotten a little bit better about saying no to people who just show up like with one-time patches for obscure operating systems, uh, unless they can commit that they're going to stay around and keep updating that. <sighs> yeah? What, uh, is the list long? Can you tell us what else is on it for the, the list? Of yeah. Um, Uh, that's what it looks like. Um, these are sort of like our first class candidates here. They're the ones that are like really getting done on basically a daily basis. These are the ones that we support, but like, you know, it's not as good. And we would prefer if people could do more stuff about that. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, and we also have a we also have like tool chain requirements uh, where we say you know your compiler must support these features as well, uh, even if they're not in you know, necessarily mandated by POSIX. Uh, and that, that page I just flashed up really goes into details about why we uh, chose this approach. And one of the things that that page mentions is that um, you, you can't build something like GNOME on top of POSIX. You, you just can't do it. I mean, POSIX is great. I love it. Um, it's very well written. Uh, it's, it tends not to be too ambiguous. Uh, you get a very good idea of what you're allowed to do by POSIX. Uh, but it's simply not enough. Um, you know, really simple things like power management, uh, completely silent on this topic. Um, you know, how do I change the system time zone? I, I don't know. Left to, left to the vendor to decide. POSIX is really minimal. Um, we need more than that. Um, and, and what I was saying before, uh, there, there's this, you can, you can talk about, OK, we're, we're adhering to POSIX, so it should work on all systems. Uh, but in practice, that doesn't work either. Uh, because there's always something that, you know, even if you think you followed the spec, 
uh, you actually didn't, and you're using some specific uh, behavior that you know is only on Linux or something. And you don't know that when you run it on other systems, even if they are POSIX compliant, uh, that it's going to break horribly. And unless you're actually testing on those systems, you're never going to find out about that. Um, and that sort of brings me to an important point, um, which is that nobody in GNOME like hates FreeBSD or any of the BSDs. Uh, there's this idea going around that it's really true, um, but it's not. Um, we, we, I, I mean, some people are like BSD friendly. Um, some people, you know, couldn't give a damn. I think is probably a good way of describing it. Just like, okay, whatever, you're over there. Um, but nobody is actively hostile. Um, and even like the people who don't really care, if you show up with patches in hand they're generally pretty good about applying them. Um, it really is just a matter of, uh, you know, we make mistakes. Uh, what can we do? Uh, we, we all are running Linux in GNOME for the most part. Uh, when we write code, uh, occasionally we depend on a feature. We don't realize this is in POSIX. Honest mistake. Um, and it, it's really good, and we appreciate it if people are calling us out on this stuff. Um, but there is uh, sort of another kind of issue. Um, which, you know, the stuff I was saying about, stuff that's not in POSIX. Um, in, in GNOME, we sort of have this approach where uh, we call it draining the swamp. Uh, and basically it's, okay, um, everything's crap. Uh, we, need, we need to build some feature. Um, we can't do it with what we have here. So we kind of need to like plumb through the whole uh, platform layer in order to get what we want. And uh, that often means that we're writing new stuff. Um, you know, like uh, things like systemd, in fact. Um, uh, coming originally from someone uh, quite involved in the GNOME project. Uh, and, and these things are doing useful stuff for us, like uh, what I mentioned before about uh, an API for changing the time zone, or, um, or the date and time, uh, or changing the host name, or stuff like this. Um, before in GNOME, these were parts of GNOME, and they were done in like system-dependent ways in this weird backend with lots of ifdef that nobody ever looked at, and it was running as root, and um, we're, we're happy not to have that in our code uh, if we can depend on a feature that's provided by the operating system. Um, so uh, why, why it's interesting for me to focus on uh, the BSDs a little bit more is because uh, fr from the standpoint of glib, um, sure, we have to support Windows and Mac and all that, but GNOME itself uh, doesn't target Windows and Mac. So if not uh, operating systems like BSD, GNOME as a desktop is basically a Linux-only affair. Um, so having, having another platform uh, that we can target is quite useful for us um, in terms of you know, going from it's theoretically portable to it's actually portable. And um, even, even just having like just one, like FreeBSD, for example, uh, you find really a lot of the portability issues um, just because you know, there's a different compiler. So, I mean, Clang and GCC kind of, in some ways, they're the same compiler because they support all the same features. Um, but you do find a lot more bugs just by having one other C compiler. And then after that one extra, you know, you get maybe three C compilers. You get uh, diminishing returns here quite quickly. Uh, same with like libc, kernel, anything else. Um, just having like that one extra is going to find really a lot of portability issues because any Linux-specific feature, instantly you find out about it. Um, It's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, sometimes that's true. Uh, it's actually often false. Because, um, so uh, to give an example of, of something that we recently added support for in glib um, that depends on a GCC feature, uh, and therefore we cannot use it in glib itself, um, uh, there's this thing called a cleanup attribute in GCC, which is phenomenally useful. Um, and it allows you to define an attribute on a local variable that when it goes out of scope, it automatically gets a function called on it um, that will you know, free it or whatever. This could phenomenally include, uh, improve our code quality. Uh, and we can't use it uh, because we have to be portable, right? Um, we often run into things like this, that like, if only we had this compiler feature everywhere, we could do this thing that would make our code really a lot more readable, a lot better quality. Um, so yeah. sometimes you're forced to go to the lowest common denominator. Yeah, and that does hurt code quality often. Or is there any, uh, any other supported uh, compiler? Because Clang has uh, cleanup. 
Yeah, um, I, again, uh, in lots of GNOME projects use the cleanup stuff. Oh my goodness. Yeah, sorry, I ain't giving a talk. <laughs> um, lo lots of GNOME stuff that only targets uh, Linux and FreeBSD will use that stuff. Um, but in Glib, we also have to target uh, Mac OS yeah. and Windows. Well, Mac OS, again, wouldn't be a problem, but yeah, we, we target Visual Studio, so it's a no-go. And in theory, like if you wanted to use the Intel compiler or the Sun compiler, uh, that stuff is still supported in Glib. So uh, yeah, we can't rely on that feature, which is unfortunate, and I'd like to. Uh, but yeah, often if you try and support multiple systems, it, it does force you to think in a more abstract way, and sometimes that leads to improvements. Um, but I'd, I'd actually argue that Honestly, just being able to do it once and do it a certain way is almost always better from the code being cleaner, actually. Um, fewer abstractions, I think, can actually be a good thing. Uh, just because it's less code overall, right? So, um, yeah, so a little more uh, detail about what I was talking about earlier, sort of going back over to the FreeBSD side of things now. Um, there was GNOME 2 imports forever after GNOME 3 was released. Um, the uphill battle I was talking about with the new versions, uh, it, was, it was hard to stay uh, sort of up to date with that. So a while ago, um, I sort of approached the GNOME FreeBSD team and said, hey, there's this thing called JHField. I think you guys should run it. Um, and what JHField is, for those who don't know, is uh, it's sort of like a meta build system. GNOME is really very large. Uh, it's like if you talk about it and its closely related external dependencies, you're talking like 160 tarballs, more or less. Um, and building all of those is uh, a bit of a pain. So we have JHBuild, which does that for us. Um, and you know, it'll go and download, and then it'll configure it, make, make, install. And it does something cool. You can install it in your home directory, uh, and then it'll set up a bunch of environment variables like LD library path and all that stuff. So that when you build the next module, uh, which depends on that first one, it can find the include files and the libraries and all that in your home directory. So you can do this without messing up your system. Um, and one of the, yeah, sure. I was just going to ask what JH stands for. Uh, James Henstridge, he's the guy that wrote it. Okay. Little bit of a history there. He's a cool guy. Um, one of the really cool things about JHBuild, though, is that uh, its default mode of operation is that it takes all of the software out of Git, um, and it takes it out of Git master. So if you want to know what's in GNOME like today, as of the thing that got committed five minutes ago, you can compile it with JHBuild, and you're going to get that. Um, the reason that that's really cool is uh, you can really keep track of any issues that might be sneaking into the code at any given time. Um, and certainly, if we're doing that on FreeBSD, uh, then we get a really good idea of any potential portability issues uh, that are sneaking into the code at any given time, um, which is wonderful. And this is where that whole stitch in time saves nine thing comes in. Uh, when you find somebody did a commit uh, that caused a problem, you, or you find you know maybe we're doing it once a day. It worked yesterday. It doesn't work today. So maybe there's like 10 commits. Yeah, this looks like the one that caused the problem. I can email that person. It's fresh in their mind. I can file a bug about it. They're, they're probably going to have some idea of what they can do to fix it at that point. Uh, versus if I'm waiting you know, six months or a year later when the release comes, it's not working. Oh, geez, OK, what changed? Um, I don't even know how to track this down, whose fault it is. Even if I do figure out what commit it is, I go to that person. Uh, OK, um, do you remember this thing you did a year ago? Yeah, it's causing me trouble now. Can you reevaluate that? Well, no, sorry. I'm like on totally something else now. Uh, I, I can't do that for you. Um, so um, the, the FreeBSD GNOME team, uh, uh, Cope has uh, been a big part of this, uh, is basically every day running JHBuild on FreeBSD now at least once a day. Um, and Tingwei Lan, also another person who's doing this very actively. And when stuff breaks, they're filing bugs upstream uh, right away. And this isn't, just, uh, this isn't just portability bugs. I mean, we have, uh, we have continuous builders as well running on Linux uh, in GNOME. But sometimes the, the BSD guys are the first ones who find problems where it's just like, did you actually test this before you committed it? Uh, and these bugs are going upstream too. Uh, and this has is, this is really resulted in uh, a fundamental shift in the relationship, I think, between FreeBSD and GNOME. Um, because when 
GNOME contributors and GNOME hackers and maintainers have really become uh, accustomed to receiving bug reports from FreeBSD uh, people now. And uh, they're pretty good, in my opinion, about replying to them. We have a wiki page, actually. I should pull that up. That sort of details uh, everything that's been going on. Hmm? Yeah, so this page is huge. Um, I mean, you see the scroll bar there. It's, uh, it's really impressive. Like this is, you know, if you want to get it set up, you got to do all this stuff. Um, yeah, these are the outstanding issues in GNOME, uh, which is some uh, low priority stuff. But the most impressive thing is like this, are the issues that we've solved. Um, and that goes on, like, it's just a huge number of patches that were sent upstream and applied by upstream happily. Uh, for addressing FreeBSD portability issues. And that list is growing all the time. One patch rejected upstream, um, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, that was a patch against UDEV. Um, and I talked to the maintainer about that recently, and he might change his mind. <laughs> so like the, the response from upstream has been great about that. Um, yeah, so that's really good. Um, yeah, as I said, you, you all saw the list. Um, it's pretty good, and it's just getting bigger. Uh, so what do we do? Um, so one of the things I was mentioning is about how POSIX is not, uh, is not good enough for us. Um, so, you know, we're, we're doing things like login D uh, uh, for power management and stuff and, you know, figuring out which session is the active one. And we're depending on things like UDEV for enumerating hardware and all that. Um, it, and this is my opinion, and it's something that I've, I've talked about with the release team of GNOME, and they're sort of on board with this idea. Um, uh, the, the approach to um, portability that I like is that you depend on an API, not a particular piece of software in name. And when I say an API, I mean like, you know, uh, a header file that you include that has a certain set of symbols of a given name in it, or a PC file, a uh, package config, uh, that you link into your project, and again, gets you a certain set of symbols that you can use in the project. Um, so th this is for things like, say I wanted to enumerate all the webcams on the system. Uh, it would be good if I had just a single PC file that I could include uh, they got me an API that looked a certain way that I could use. And I could, I could do that everywhere. That would, that would be really great uh, for me from the upstream standpoint. Um, as it turns out, we have this. Uh, it's UDEV on Linux right now. It's not the most portable API. Um, th there's nothing stopping people from implementing it, per se, but I can understand why people wouldn't want to, because it's very Linux-specific. Like, it's putting stuff from the kernel in there. and. Uh, other things like the login D APIs or the other system D service APIs, I think they're really good APIs. Um, and I, I wish people would just implement them. And w it, it would never be our intent to depend on system D, for example, but to depend on anyone who's willing to provide these APIs. Uh, and, and in my opinion, that is sort of the best approach to portability. Uh, because for lack of that, I'm basically having to write different backends or put if defs in my code uh, and stuff like that. So. So we, we do need to depend on more than just POSIX, but in, in a way, POSIX kind of gives us a good idea about, well, why don't we write a spec for what we expect from the operating system? Uh, and then everybody can implement that spec. And one of the cool things about a lot of systemd is you can, uh, it has a wiki page where it says, here's the various APIs that we implement in systemd, and here are the ones that we think should be reasonably portable to other systems. And by the way, here's where they are documented, and this documentation is firm, and we don't plan on changing the API. Um, and on that topic is, uh, I think systemd, I, I mean, if you look at, we sort of did HAL and like device kit, and we did like uh, DevFS we had. Um, we're getting to a place in, I, I, I mean, before, as I said, we, we sort of started out from the standpoint of GNOME. We need to do stuff. Uh, how do we get this stuff done? Uh, it all sucks. What can we really do about it? Uh, so we, we started doing things. And it was kind of at a point where, you know, Dbus was new. We were kind of getting a grasp of how we write good Dbus services. HAL did what we needed it to do for a while. Uh, but it was clearly sort of an experimental foray into this new world. Uh, and it wasn't great. And sim similarly, console kit, um, you know, it, it did what it needed to do, but it wasn't great. So we're sort of now at a point where we have, uh, and, and really a lot of this is being done under the banner of systemd, 
uh, we have, for the first time, something that people actually feel good about, uh, and the, that is good. And I, I think that it's going to be around for a while. So when, when BSD people ask me, well, you know, we, we did the HAL thing, and then you guys like ripped the carpet out under us. Are you going to do the same thing with System D? Um, I don't think so. I think System D is here for a while. Um, so uh, basic stuff uh, about like just what I, what I think anybody uh, who's interested in any kind of large software project uh, porting it to BSD is get upstream. Uh, if you're maintaining patches in the ports tree, uh, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, but not always, uh, because get upstream first. Um, th this is something that I I've been involved in Ubuntu uh, for a long time. And Ubuntu is a, a definitely a project that has an interesting history with the GNOME project as well. It hasn't always been friendly. Uh, but we sort of, uh, they sort of developed uh, a certain, let's say, protocol of what is considered good behavior uh, for interacting with upstream projects. And uh, upstream first is basically the number one principle. Uh, if you get a problem and you need to fix that with a patch, uh, y your first step should be getting that patch upstream. Uh, but it, where the first comes in is that, okay, so you sent it upstream and now they're ignoring you because the maintainer is busy or whatever. By all means, put that in the ports tree as a, as a patch against the package. Uh, but when you do that, make sure at the top of it, as a description, as part of it, you know, provide a link to the bug. Explain why it's needed. Uh, and maybe even give them a week to see if they can get it in. Uh, and then you could, you know, maybe they, they change it a little to make it a little bit better in some way that only they would know how to do because it's their project. Uh, you get a better patch by doing that. Um, so I'm kind of getting to the end of like the main thesis of this thing. So I'm just going to throw on a bunch of points here. I kind of thought the audience would be a bit bigger, I have to admit. Uh, my wish, li wish list items for things that could be better in BSD. Um, Getting this stuff implemented would be really nice. Uh, hi, Baptiste. Um, yeah, KQ64 would be good, uh, mostly because it would let us uh, set uh, KQ events for absolute monotonic time with microsecond or nanosecond accuracy. Because uh, if you only have 32-bit counters and you want microsecond or nanosecond accuracy against the monotonic time, that stops working after, I don't know, some number of days of uptime. Uh, so you basically need the 64-bit uh, for that. Um, yeah, I, this sucks. Uh, please, uh, some kind of a, a file notification API would be good. It does not suck. It's not done for what you want. So we need something new along with it. It, it, sucks, it sucks that I have to use this. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on that topic, if we could make this a little bit better, I would ask uh, for the implementation of this, uh, which is something. Yeah, this macOS has this, and it makes uh, a filt v node slightly less horrible. Um, basically, you can open a file like this, just like o read only or o read write. You say o evt only, um, and you can't do anything with the file except stick it in a KQ, uh, and then you get notifications about changes. And the biggest difference there is that you can actually unmount the file system that you did this on. So we can watch for files on removable media. Um, yeah, because right now we have to pull basically. Uh, so that would be good. Um, get, it, get it on the recording if Bat says that would be easy to implement. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So well, Baptiste well, says that this will be very easy to implement, uh, and he plans on doing it next week. Tonight. No? <laughs> Tonight? Oh, awesome. even better. <laughs> um, just some miscellaneous stuff. Uh, some of it's on that web page. Uh, LibTool is still setting RPath in inappropriate ways on BSD. It would be cool if it could stop doing that. Uh, so you stopped installing LA files for the most part. We do not install LA files most of the time, or if we install them, they are empty. But uh, our path is still getting set, um, which is annoying. I think we changed that. Huh. Okay. Just to check. But you're probably right. Yeah, well, if you look in your like, JH build install directory, just you know, look on the libraries and see if they have an R path. And if they don't, then it's good. But if they do, and I think that they do. Um, uh, this is another huge one. Uh, as I said, like, uh, what we consider an API is often the package config file. Uh, and there's a lot of things in the base system in BSD that implement APIs that we'd expect to have package config files, and they don't. Uh, so we have to you know, hack configure arguments in order to get them registered. Yeah, but usually some of those, because I think, at least in the head, not, not in release yet, 
but I think we have added all the missing PC, PC files. Ah. So basically, uh, basically the archive, uh, everything which is uh, things like Zlib and stuff. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's good. This is really good when I'm like, I have a to-do list and everybody's telling me, yeah, next version, it's going to be good. Yeah, Already done. We probably, probably not do that for open stuff because the goal is more to hide the ah, yeah. so that we use both version or the version or whatever. But. Okay, and since you're working on, uh, what was the one you're working on tonight? You're working on the OEVT only tonight. So tomorrow night, you have to work on this one. Um, that'd be really cool. If I could yeah. ask, which package do I have to install in order to get this yes. file on my system? So, so this one, we have it not only for a while, and it's not implemented for one reason. Right now, it's because the database will be too huge. So the idea is to go through the APT way and uh, having a separate database so that you can have an equivalent of APT file. Uh, actually, uh, Packet Repo does already, is already able to create that. So it's just a matter of instrumenting that uh, all the, the stuff under the hood is already available somewhere. Yeah, so yeah. this would help a lot uh, because JHBuild has a feature called SysDeps. Um, and as, as I said, GNOME has a ton of dependencies. And maybe you saw at the start of that wiki page, it said, type pkg install this. Uh, and having uh, JHBuild is actually able to figure out that itself if it has some way of saying which package provides this file. Uh, so that would be cool. And uh, here's one I just threw in that's, that's pretty funny. Um, this, you have this libgeom. Uh, in FreeBSD, uh, and most functions in it are geom underscore, uh, but some are gctl underscore, and some are g underscore. Uh, and there's there's another popular library that also uses g underscore. Um, and yeah, we both have the symbol, <laughs> so no GNOME program can link against libgeom, which is a problem for uh, gtop. Um, so uh, in some ways, I kind of wanted to start a conversation. Um, I, I'm pretty much uh, done with the slides now. If anybody wants to like talk about you know experience they've had or like I, I approached a GNOME developer once and this happened and can you help me out with this, uh, that'd be pretty cool. I, I just like the idea that it sounds like the project initially didn't really. I mean, there, there's traditionally a rivalry between projects, but it's usually overblown and it's usually a system rivalry where they're really yeah, like GNOME KDE guys. or whatever. Yes. Yeah. But I like the idea that once they found there was valuable information in the form of PRs or bug reports in that case from another project, it, it probably didn't matter to them what other project it was as long as the information was valuable. And mm -hmm. it's like, hey, it turns out they're our friends. Yeah, and I, I mean, my approach to that has always been, well, at least my new approach since a couple of years ago when I decided, you know, this let's make everybody happy thing just isn't working anymore. Um, if somebody's willing to show up and like do it regularly, and it's certainly if it's going to improve my code quality, by all means. And if I've done something that's Linux specific and there's a better POSIX equivalent and there's nothing worse about it, then by all means, I'm happy to use that one. Um, and I, I think almost anybody would do this. Like we, we get things like, oh, you're assuming a bash feature in bin sh. You can't do that. Everybody's happy to fix those kinds of bugs. Right, but I think there are, there are a lot of people who think that, oh, they're another project, they're not going to want our input anyway. And yeah, that, that's absolutely, right, yeah. Right, but I think that is a common misperception that, that should be corrected. Yeah, and I if... The I mean, Leonard said openly that he was, he didn't care about anything about Linux. So Leonard, yeah. That's, I, that's not entirely true. He said that he didn't care, he did not want to uh, implement compatibility inside systemd for that, but it makes sense because it's uh, Linux only stuff. I mean, our init doesn't have any compatibility with something else. Uh, the problem after that is the scope of what systemd does, and probably some parts could be portable, but the reason why he won't don't want to get any patches from the BSD makes, in my opinion, sense, because we don't want Linux patches in our init. Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, having talked to Leonard a lot on this topic, he he is actually actively anti-BSD. Uh, he is one of the few people I know who I'd actually yeah, say. Yeah, I uh, he wishes that like all of the BSDs would just die so that everybody focuses on Linux instead, right? Um, but he is the only one I know, like the singular person I know that has this extreme attitude on the topic. Uh, 
I, no, I don't think he would come. <laughs> I, I don't think he would come. Uh, Bastian, I, I think he, you know, we, uh, we have this GNOME OS idea, right? Which is uh, we want to build this whole operating system, start from Linux and like all this stack all the way up. And GNOME OS to different people means a lot of different things. Um, and one thing it, it was, was this continuous integration. We would build this image for virtual machines that we could test and do it every day. Actually, we do it on every commit. Uh, and this is like a part of what that was, but what it mostly was, in my opinion, is just a list of things that you have to have in your system in order for it to be considered a GNOME OS. Like, this has to work properly, this has to work properly, we need this. And I would say that FreeBSD doesn't meet those criteria, but only because you don't have things like Network Manager. Um, and if, if you got all of these things and it was working at the same level, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that this couldn't be GNOME OS in the same sense, even. on something which is not directly GNOME project like LogID or uh, Network Manager or whatever, that the, the do actually list the, the actual API for it they rely on so that if we have to uh, create some kind of wrapper on top of our own libraries mm -hmm. and provide the same API, we can have at least the first level of subset API we need to do and probably later have people I improving it. But having this list, I mean, for LogD, for example, I, I'm not sure. I, I think you don't rely on that many APIs. Or yeah, so this is, is quite large number of APIs. This is a conversation I've had um, with the systemd guys uh, a couple of times, and in fact, that one rejected patch that was on that wiki page is basically uh, this. And uh, this goes back to what I was saying that for me, uh, an API is a package config file, yeah. uh, and saying that, okay, you implement this API uh, and you provide this package config file, but it only implements a subset of the APIs, uh, to me, that's, that's never gonna cut it. I don't like that. Uh, what I would rather, and, and that's what this bug was about, is if there's something like LogND that has a whole bunch of things in one API, a lot of them not related to one another, well then really maybe that's three APIs. Um, and we're, we're talking Dbus there, so it doesn't make as much sense, uh, but in this case it was UDEV. And you know you had all the UDEV APIs, and then separately you had this HWDB thing where you could look up PCI IDs and stuff like that. And this was all grouped together under a single API, one package config file. And we wanted to just use the hardware DB lookup, which in no way depended on anything in the kernel. It was basically a hash table lookup in a, a database file. And there was no reason that couldn't have been separate. And having that as a separate package config and therefore a separate API, in my opinion, is something I wanted. Yeah, but what I mean by that is, um, I, I, we have started for uh, Xorg and we want to extend it for a lot of things, a product, uh, libdev2, which queries devices, basically. So the idea is to provide an equivalent high-level API that you can get through UDEV or UDEV like stuff. And uh, if you want to put priority on what kind of query you want to do first, then if you have a list of what you expect from UDEV, uh, extracting the wiki page or whatever, then we know that probably the priority is to hack on querying this kind of hardware or this kind of hardware events for this kind of, of stuff. And so that we can have something which is good enough uh, for GNOME to be able to use along with. But is your intent to provide like a UDEV API or to provide an no, equivalent API? Provide, uh, well, the goal of DDF2 is to have to provide their, its own API and backend for basically anything. So the goal is to be able to unify all non-Linux operating system that right now doesn't have a UDEV API. If they want, they can just plug into our version of the same kind of library so that if you're GNOME, you just have two things to... Yeah, so in, in my opinion, this is unacceptable, in fact. Um, I, I don't want a situation where normal applications are expected to deal well, with one API or another. Backend, so you have only our um, something that I think would be far more likely and people would find to be more acceptable is that we put something in GIO, for example, uh, which wraps both of them and provides an even higher level and nicely G-objectified yeah. API. Yeah. Uh, and we deal with the abstraction in Glib. Because yeah. I, I really don't consider it in any way appropriate that normal applications should have to do this. Yeah, that works to me. But anyway, uh, I need to know what GIO in that case would expect from the operating system below. So that when I implement my library, I know that my priority is on this, this, this. And this is cool, but no one needs this stuff for portability yet, so. Yeah, and that's, that's something that I wanted to work on. Uh, 
It, it's something that, you know, it's on the wiki page is something we should get this. Uh, but it's not something that I personally have a lot of time to work on right now. I got uh, pulled into a lot of stuff like with application confinement stuff, um, which is pretty interesting work too. But if somebody wanted to undertake a project of making a high level wrapper in GIO that would wrap UDEV and also equally well wrap uh, whatever BSD API is going to be forthcoming, that would be a project I'd be very much interested in. And that's the kind of thing that GNOME people would even like because UDEV, it gets the job done. Uh, it's not a great API, right? So if they could have a nicer API that's easier for them to use and be more portable at the same time, I mean, that's just a win for everybody. Yeah, because I mean, we just cannot create the UDEV API because it exposes some internal Linux. Uh, yeah, like CFS. insert weird string here. There is no, no, there is all the CFS stuff which is exposed and we cannot expose the same thing. So uh, you will need it, if you want portability of this on, on the BSD, you will need it anyway to get your uh, abstraction on GLE for that. Yeah, as far as I see it, that would be pretty much the only acceptable way forward for GNOME. Uh, having in each application if def or whatever would not be good. For us, it's even better because ever, even things which are relying on JDB, but not GNOME, we can just talk to Opsync and say, use your abstraction. Yep. And we know that we just have to focus on JDB to, uh, to, to get the portability. And yeah, so if anybody wanted to work on this kind of thing, I'd, I'd really be happy to sort of mentor uh, this project and say, okay, you know, this is what I think the API should look like and then go and do it. I, I'd, I'd be happy about that. Um, it probably be a summer of code for next year. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, and again, for LoginD, uh, there's a lot of APIs in LoginD that we need to use, but again, it's only a subset of some of them. And exposing that subset in sort of a nice way through GObject could also be something that's appealing. Although LoginD has a pretty decent API already. Uh, but, but there are some things like it makes you deal directly with file descriptors for the uh, suspense stuff, and probably most people would rather deal with a G object instead, for example. Cool. Um, thank you for coming. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, have you, uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on the different um, uh, file system event notification APIs that um, yeah, Apple does it best, I think. Um, e even iNotify is pretty crappy. I, I hate iNotify. Uh, but even iNotify is like a world better than what is available in FreeBSD. Yeah, so we're, we're looking at, um, uh, on behalf of the FreeBSD Foundation, we're looking at trying to fund a project to um, uh, handle I Notify, something like iNotify. Yeah, I hear there is an idea that uh, instead of uh, queuing up an FD inside of KQ, you could like tell it about an inode instead, right? Uh, well, there's a whole bunch of different ideas, but I'm just I'm curious if um, uh, we're trying to figure out what the best the best approach would be. Uh, and I mean, you know, an option on the table is we'll we'll make an FS events um, compatible interface. Yeah, F F FS events is good for high, most high level things, I'd say. Um, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work the way that we kind of have our API working in glib, in fact. Um, it's more like, you know, what changed since, uh, where glib is more about like online all the time and it, it's not interested in something that happened when the system was down because the API just doesn't expose this concept. I'd say, if I were to tell you like the things that I don't like about iNotify, for example, yeah. um, one of them would be that it's extremely difficult to know which file I'm actually monitoring uh, because if you imagine, I, I think about race conditions a lot. Um, and if I imagine I have somebody basically actively attacking my algorithm to monitor files, I could imagine I get into a situation where I have a bunch of files being renamed. I, I notify a file named A, uh, which then gets like renamed out from under me. And then I stat the file. And even if I stat the file on both sides are telling I notify, watch that file, I could think that I'm monitoring an inode that's different from the one that I notify actually caught. And that disturbs me a lot. Um, and then it's moved, and now I don't know, okay, so it's moved, so the thing that I think I'm watching is not actually the thing that I'm watching. Uh, so you get into situations where you have to like watch the parent directory to make sure that no moves occurred on it, and then you have to watch the parents directory, parents directory, and like this is a bit of a mess. So having some, I mean, in a certain sense, the KQ thing's a little bit better that way because at least I have the FD in hand, right? And then I can, I can put that in KQ and I can F stat the FD. So at least I know that it's the same thing. Uh, so that's a little bit nice, I guess. 
Uh, but without EVT only, uh, having that FD open is also a risk because e even if I only have it open for a millisecond, if somebody tries to unmount that file system at that exact point, it's not going to wait for me to close it. It's just going to tell them, no, I can't. And that's a problem too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, file system notification is something I thought a bit about. Maybe we could talk about that after. Sure. Okay, thank you.